Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome and good morning everyone. I am Shweta Naik from the host institution, uh, HBCSC Mumbai. I work in mathematics education and mathematics education research. Uh, we are here today uh, for the plenary talk in Epistemy 9. Uh, so welcome everyone. Welcome Dr. Babu and your team at French Institute. Uh, so uh, Dr. Babu is going to speak on mathematical experience and alienation towards social histories of practice. Uh, he needs no introduction. Actually, he's very popular in several circles. Uh, but nonetheless, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, he's a dear colleague. Uh, Dr. Santil Babu is a historian of mathematics based at the French Institute of Pondicherry uh, in South India. He's involved in studies concerning nature, knowledge, and labor. He's coordinating a research program in the social history of vernacular mathematical practices in medieval South India in collaboration with Chair, History and Philosophy of Mathematics at ETH Zurich. His book, Mathematics and Society, Numbers and Measures in Early Modern South India, will be soon published by Oxford University in 2022. So look for it. He's a member of the editorial board of the series, uh, Verum Factum, uh, Studies in Political Epistemology. And he's also a member of the Politically Mathematics Collective in India. Uh, so most collaborations that he is in, he has given the uh, website address so you can find those in the proceedings where he has given his abstract. Uh, he has also motivated many of us to question hegemonies in our work, uh, question our work. So I am very thankful to the work uh, that Dr. Sanjil Babu does. So I'll stop here uh, without much delay and handing over to Dr. Babu. Uh, to the participants, you can type in your questions anytime that they occur to you, or you can wait till end and type them or write them in the chat box. Uh, so, Dr. Babu, over to you. And Thank you, Shweta. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. So, at the outset, I wanted to say that uh, this is really uh, a collective presentation with all my friends and comrades, uh, some of us sitting in the room, some of us uh, hopefully uh, listening in. And it's been uh, part of the initiatives taken by the Politically Mathematics Collective, which is a group of uh, some of us, individuals uh, and collectors, uh, who have been trying to subject contemporary mathematical practices to public scrutiny and not let it out of uh, the framework of analysis and to see how it actively or uh, renders oppression and exploitation possible in, uh, in the neoliberal expert uh, end of the framework. And that's what has brought us together. It, the collective involves a lot of people involved in mathematics education, uh, very few historians, of course, and uh, a lot of working mathematicians. And, thing. and uh, so we've been uh, meeting regularly. We have discussions and then identify public issues and then try and create pedagogic resources, especially addressing not so much the formal classroom in school and college, although not out of it, but also to kind of create new organized spaces of knowledge sharing with the working people uh, directly. That's been our uh, objective and hopefully we'll keep doing it. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining and listening. And uh, this uh, uh, talk and presentation was actually put together over the last uh, couple of years with a lot of people involved uh, in doing the field work, in, in organizing the thought process and therefore uh, I just wanted to acknowledge everyone's uh, contribution to this, and I'm presenting on everyone's behalf. Hopefully, I'll be able to do justice to what everyone has contributed to the process. So, since it is largely a community of uh, mathematics and science education thing, and to the limited knowledge that I have about uh, mathematics education as a practice, mostly history of mathematics is uh, used as an adjunct. Uh, you know, to clarify uh, aspects of mathematics teaching. Uh, but we have been, uh, some of us at least have been wondering, can history of mathematics be uh, much more actively uh, deployed to reframe some of the contours of mathematics education teaching, not entirely confined to the formal classroom, but also outside institutional learning. So, and why, uh, history of mathematics therefore becomes important to open up uh, new questions in mathematics education. Uh, it also means that uh, we need to subject the uh, history of mathematics as a practice 
and to reframe uh, its own priorities and objectives uh, to include uh, you know a different idea of mathematics as work and as practice and particularly in the indian context uh, what inspired us what what inspired us was that you know mathematics is often uh, you know written as a series of written as a series of uh, you know activities of the mind and this became the hegemonic in the, uh, histories of mathematics you know the typical lineages starting from 3rd century bc aryabhata and end up with srinivasa ramanujam in 20th 21st century dotted with uh, you know bhaskara and uh, brahmagupta and uh, the kerala school and so on so what we want to do is to uh, rewrite the histories of mathematics uh, as mathematical practices as working occupations uh of what real people do as part of their routine hard work as part of their routine jobs and in a caste society uh because occupations are caste based and it involves physical segregation the work of mathematics then served a political function and in each of these occupations there are different modes of abstraction that cuts through and as part of uh these occupations such as you know the school teacher who taught elementary mathematics in pre colonial india or the revenue accountant you know or the sculptor the artisan the blacksmith and you know and all of them there are different modes of abstraction that is integral to their routine uh, everyday occupations and uh, and the orders of abstraction in these practices uh, we think are uh, computational or mathematical and if we don't or particularly use that modern idea of mathematics way back to the 15th and 16th century for example so our program particularly the social history of mathematical practices program that some of us are trying to attempt uh, is to therefore not to render privilege to the activities of the mind alone or not to render privilege to the activity of the hand either but then to bring the hand and the mind together and to reconstruct a different uh, kind of history of mathematics and in the indian context particularly it it need not be as it is often construed to be you know there is sanskrit mathematics there is tamil mathematics there is marathi mathematics and there is assam not like that but it's not about any one particular language because in the indian context you know then the language parochialism takes over and it becomes you know it is its own kind of trajectory we don't want to subject the practitioners mathematics to that framework but to undertake such a program to all uh, indian languages but not any one single practice not just of the brahmin astronomer but also include the uh mathematical computational practices that are part of the agrarian mercantile and the uh, bureaucratic place and uh, this then enables us to look for practitioners in particular time and in particular place who has left behind their own occupational practices as texts and then if we take texts as records of practices and then start looking at the world of practices behind the texts which they have recorded then we get a huge corpus of material to in which the social history of mathematical practices can be rewritten and that's roughly uh, the kind of uh, broad framework under which we are trying to do our work and if mathematical practices is conceived as work uh, we also then are forced to confront with formal mathematics and uh, the canonized formal mathematics you know you know becomes a historical in certain other processes you know such as the the format of the textbooks the proof generated definition that defines most of contemporary mathematics then mask we think the structures of alienation and this alienation is necessarily about how work and occupation then become you know trajectories of alienation by creating certain values that is moving away from the actual source of the value creation which is often uh, labor so when social history of mathematical practices work is conceived then we can understand how the possibility of alienation which we call alienability is structured into mathematical practices and these mathematical practices render alienation possible through uh, through modes of abstraction and uh, we all know the contested issues of abstraction where someone thinks abstraction is quite liberating politically and and emotionally at times and then abstraction is also becomes prescriptive knowledge especially at the hands of experts who kind of assume the responsibility to, to prescribe knowledge to the world and to solve other people's problems and abstraction also gains a dimension of a particular process of codification where particularly this text that we are talking about you know often tell us how 
these texts codify the practice of somebody else, not necessarily of the people who are practicing the occupations, but by someone else codifying the practices of uh, somebody else. And in the process, it moves away from the occupational context, erasing caste in the Indian thing. And therefore, then it becomes abstracted as fragments of history. And then you construct a hegemonic history of mathematics that, that has nothing to do with the actual context of practice in which the practitioner uh, made mathematics possible. And, uh, and we all know are familiar with the idea of symbolization, which has a mode of convenience possibly. But when it becomes ritualized, you actually consolidate most of mathematical practices say historical, the way it is received into the classroom or into the textbook or into the way it is talked about and conceived in the popular culture. So for today, I will uh, take uh, four different historical cases, one contemporary, and then uh, try and uh, hopefully uh, discuss how uh, you know, mathematics makes alienation possible, makes, you know, builds alienability to it by looking at the broad prism of work and value creation. And there are four different contexts that I wanted to uh, talk about. One is 15th century Europe uh, through the writings of uh, Nikola Copernicus and how uh, for him uh, money was a measure of value. Uh, then we come back to the 12th century South India during the uh, uh, heydays of the so-called glorious empire uh, of the Cholas in South India, and how the measuring rod, the physical measuring device, then became the main conduit for the manipulation of value and the alienation of labor. Third, we take in the 16th century South Indian uh, case of uh, uh, how pearl traders and pearl merchants uh, created value for pearls by erasing labor uh, out of the process of valuation. And finally, we talk about uh, working women in contemporary India, where uh, the microfinance industry, the so-called non-banking finance sector, then extracts wages and creates a wealth for corporate capital by constantly measuring their trust through an elaborate computational apparatus that becomes the financial infrastructure. Uh, thing. These are the four different cases that uh, I thought we'll choose to illustrate uh, how mathematics makes alienation possible. To come to the first case, uh, we take the writings of uh, Nicola uh, Copernicus and, you know, uh, we all are familiar with the Copernican revolution and to most of the historians until recently, the Copernican revolution was all about, you know, something that happened in the uh, mind and, uh, you know, the Quire, the, the French humanist uh, historian, you know, uh, dictated the, the contours of the history of science of studying the emergence of modern science through the writings of Copernicus. And then to him, it was primarily their mental or intellectual attitude. And, uh, you know, for, for Marx and Engels, it was, you know, a breathtaking kind of uh, uh, change, uh, all supposed to have taken place in the realm of uh, pure thought. And uh, Thomas Kuhn, the most, one of the most influential thinkers in, uh, in the history of science, uh, you know, he actually talks about how Copernicus, as a man in the middle of the night, in the mind of a, you know, the, the, the Copernican revolution happened in the mind of a man deeply immersed in Christ, you know, one sudden uh, night. So, given these uh, kind of imageries of the Copernican revolution, which is always associated with the birth of modern science itself, uh, you know, we want to look at Copernicus instead as a church official. You know, as a church official, and as part of his job to do astronomy as a, as a professional, and he was also a church official to a county where he was, uh, he was almost administering the revenue apparatus of the particular county, and he was also advisor to the king of Poland. Uh, and why we have chosen uh, Copernicus as a church official, as a worker, as an everyday practitioner of astronomy, and as a mathematician, when he decides to speak and provide advice to the king of Poland, uh, because what connects all his professional qualities, you know, as an astronomer, as a revenue surveyor in a little county to the church, and, an, and as an advisor to the king, that he was constantly measuring the heavens, measuring land, and measuring value. So we wanted to bring how these various notions of measurement in Copernicus work uh, enables him to speak to the king as an advisor. And, uh, and why we have particularly chosen measurement as a prism to look into the practices of the church official in 15th century Europe is that, you know, uh, like we all know in most of the measurement, it always offers justice and fairness 
you know, the idea of measurement, but in spaces that are constitutively unequal, you know. So the promise to eliminate arbitrariness in the activity of measurement evades, uh, you know, the abstraction process that comes after measurement, as we'll see in most of the cases. And what's important to the idea of measurement is also the, the idea of a common standard, you know, the, and the complex histories of standardization in histories in different cultural contexts tells us that the measurement, the window of measurement actually provides us a possibility to link social histories of mathematics with the possibility of alienation that it imbibes for itself. So in the particular case of Copernicus, you know, uh, the goal for money and the uniform circular motion in the, in the planetary sphere then become the two most common standards, uh, this thing. And uh, in order to introduce the particular intellectual context in which Copernicus uh, practice as a church official and an advisor to the king can be situated is that, you know, sometime around the 14th century, here I uh, follow the works of Joel K, who has written this book about the birth of modern science. And he says, uh, by around the 14th century, after the post-Aristotelian thought, uh, which uh, makes individual consciousness relegated to the background of a, a serious and political and theological questions in the 13th century, and by the time in the 14th century, when the medieval university, European university was being structured and uh, conceived, uh, the scholars realized that market equality uses the geometric product of uh, build inequalities, almost like cross diagonals, each exchanger seeking to benefit more than other from the other exchanger. And that kind of defines uh, how uh, individuals are willfully subjecting themselves to a process of unequal exchange. And it creates a geometry of uh, exchange relationships, which is kind of then connected to the way uh, the ideas of nature were conceived around the same time. And this uh, distinction between the natural order and the market order in the context of conceiving equality or the possibility of it then comes about. And the models of nature that was beginning to shape themselves in about the 14th century Europe was that it was that nature was dynamic, it was self-equalizing, that it was relativistic and it was probabilistic and geometrical. And within this model somewhere, people say they could situate the birth of modern science itself in this process. And therefore, Kay talks about the six conceptual backgrounds that emerge, which helps us relate to how the orders of nature and the orders of the market kind of came together, somewhere actively mediated by the European University in the 14th century. And we see how uh, the mathematics and the geometry of the exchange became intricately tied as a public practice, as professional practice in the 15th century, in most of the uh, cases, most of the countries in Europe around that time. The idea of equality, the mean and the equalization in exchange, uh, money as a medium and measure comes quite prominently around that time. Relation with relativity of value in exchange, there is an idea of common valuation in exchange, and all of this somehow contributing to create an elaborate social geometry of a rapidly monetizing society. And uh, that's the context around uh, in which Copernicus uh, functions. And, uh, and it is also uh, useful to keep in mind that the beginning of the 14th century also uh, then uh, it was not all peaceful in Europe, one, there was an enormous amount of uh, merchant capital funding uh, the so-called exploration of the Americas, but in effect, you know, uh, creating a huge infrastructure of imperial conquest and plunder and murder uh, of the people for uh, mining silver and gold out of the American land, which was brought back to Europe. And we have this process uh, going on. And we also have a uh, widespread uh, peasant revolts in 15th century Europe. And you know, so everybody was trying to understand this nature of unrest. On the one hand, you are plundering someone else. On the one hand, you are facing revolt from with your own, with, within your own peasantry. And this was quite a troubled time. Uh, and, uh, and Copernicus, uh, as an advisor, as a mathematician who is speaking to the king, therefore writes this treatise, kind of a letter to the king of uh, Poland on uh, currency reforms and what is the idea of the money. And we take that as our source today, along with the other astronomical works uh, to illustrate how the everyday practice of the church official astronomer mathematician comes together against the background of imperial conquest and physical plunder and murder of another people, and then facing a peasant, active peasant revolt in the 15th century Europe. 
and then so we can kind of understand how copernicus and uh, you know talks about coinage and to him he tells the king of poland you know so uh, the coin you know carries metal and it is the most convenient and the most pragmatic functional way to operate money and uh, the coin has a face value and what is the face value is the the symbol of authority that it ordains an universal symbol rendering a legal and jurisdictional authority to the value of metal so that it is seemingly just and trustworthy all right but then what is the intrinsic value is the actual weight and the proportion of the metal that goes into the making of the coin not to mention the expenditure that goes into minting the coin itself and then the the burden of minting the coin and the burden of rendering legal political authority to uh, you know in the name of creating trust in the coin then is actually inscribed by the royal insignia and therefore the symbolic value then adds to the intrinsic value of the metal but then the problem there uh, is that but the value of the metal keeps changing you know especially we if you all know the history of the so called explorations and voyages of the uh, the conquest of the americas we all know how so many bankers and mercantile capital then got lost in anticipation of bullion including you know uh, america vespucci if you, if you read his work called the novus mundus which is uh, written around the same time then you know the the idea of navigation itself you know becomes the geometric exploration of the world but as provides a template for extraction of uh, precious metals uh, from other countries so in the light of this fluctuating prices of the metal versus bullion you know the the intrinsic value is supposed to con constantly uh, changing and then copernicus talks about uh, the wear and tear of usage and of course inflation and he says uh, you know what are the possibilities of subverting the promise of justice that the symbolic value uh, and the uh, and, and therefore the royal authority on the coin itself becomes worse you can you know so this often the possibilities of he anticipates corruption he anticipates cheating and then he says what are the possible ways in which justice can be denied is through defective weight of the metal in the coin or defective proportion or both and uh, therefore he says uh, when whenever there is uh, debasement of coinage whenever there is supposed to be a currency reform most of us in india have gone through this very the painful memory of demonetization ourselves and it's something akin to what happened in the 15th century europe and quite frequently so uh, is that you know we have uh, the, when the new coin replaces the old coin okay, you know it's based on the proportion of silver and it's based on the the constantly fluctuating price of metal itself and then copernicus says Uh, when the new should replace the old coin it should be done completely and then he says uh, the idea of the dearer money or the sound money and and money the cheaper money is that the more that money is cheaper it actually breeds laziness among the working people you know and then therefore he says it it should be absolutely ensured that everyone returns the old money completely not without a single coin should be left in the thing because that becomes cheaper and makes people lazy lazy and uh, when well, the mass of money ran you know if if it does remain behind you know the old money remains behind then he says there is a incessant widespread complaint you know of soaring prices especially on gold silver food and wage and the workman's labor he says cultivate sloth and laziness and indolence by making the money uh, cheaper and he has this particular uh, authoritative prescriptive knowledge as a professional where he says that every 25 years a currency reform has to be therefore necessarily done in order to eliminate the possibility of people becoming slothful and uh, indulgent and we see how uh, the you know the, the the weight and proportion of the metal uh, therefore then becomes a template for the making of value through the money and therefore money becomes the measure and in the process of money becoming a common uh, becoming a measure uh, to him uh, the 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 you know the the hegemonic prussian empire and its flourishing becomes the most fundamental gold standard and uh, just as uh, the royal insignia then the king the monarch uh, it is his responsibility uh, 
to preserve the uh, standard of money, which is to establish the gold standard uh, in the thing. And therefore, by guaranteeing the establishment and maintenance of the standard, then the monarchy ensures the unity of the social through political authority, just like the sun does so in the planetary sphere. So in his, uh, you know, the so-called revolutionary work, then he talks about how, you know, the middle of everything is the sun, he compares it to the royal throne, and uh, therefore it is royalty and monarchy that actually ensures the harmonious linkage between the motion of spheres, just like in real life that the king has to ensure the gold standard and therefore create social unity through political authority. And in this cosmopolitical order that Copernicus quite elaborately constructs through his advice to the king of Poland, we how do I mean we actually do realize how less just like the uniform circular motion, the uniformity of the circle that ensures the harmony of spheres for the planetary cosmos, the Prussian gold standard, the florin, you know, the weight of silver and metal is remains the fundamental measure of all money and therefore all work in society, which has to be, uh, you know, done by the king and the value that is created out of this prescriptive knowledge rendered by the mathematician astronomer is the value of the stability of state power, which then enables the making of money out of commerce, and if you enable the making of money out of commerce, then you are also enabling making money out of money. And therefore, society goes on smoothly, peacefully, but without even for a moment talking about how you are actually plundering and murdering people and mining uh, this thing, completely erasing the, the value of labor, which provided the metal, which is the fundamental measure of all money, is what in this cosmopolitical uh, order that Copernicus creates. And... Uh, We'll come to the second case, how uh, to the 12th century South India, where we talk about yeah. So this is uh, 12th century South India, roughly could be seen uh, as you know uh, the Chola Empire. Sometime it's big. The process of the empire building begins sometime in the 9th century, achieves its peak in the 10th and 11th century, and the 12th century you find a uh, heavy uh, monetization uh, that this process is going through. And then the dark black thing, the Chola Mandalam is at the center of the thing, which is right at the heart of what is today, uh, the Kaveri Delta uh, of uh, South India. And uh, we find uh, in, this, in this particular discussion, we'll talk about how uh, a physical re-engineering of the land itself through the process of empire building then creates an elaborate computational apparatus to abstract the value of the land away from the context of labor and then provide a political authority to a particular caste group, in this case, establishing a Brahmin hegemony in the 12th century. And we see how these three things come together uh, through the activity of standardizing the measuring rod, which of course is also contested by peasants revolting against the state and the landowners over a period of about 50, 60 years sometime in the uh, 12th century. And that's roughly the story that we'll talk about now. And uh, why do we say that uh, at the heart of the Chola Empire, the Chola Mandalam, we have uh, a process where it starts sometime around the 10th century, like historians have documented, is the establishment of what are called Brahmadeyas. And these Brahmadeyas are primarily exclusively Brahmin settlements, which are also called the Agraharas. And they were created for the Brahmins, and uh, it happened under a process where the king was trying to part with a part of his revenue, which was growing bigger. And then he mobilizes and settles Brahmins all over uh, the country and then shares his own income with that other Brahmins and uh, makes them, uh, and, uh, you know, create, uh, new settlements are created and the rights of cultivation and overlordship is given to the uh, Brahmins. And, uh, this, this particular relationship between the royalty and the Brahmins then creates a uh, hegemonic apparatus which has continued to kind of reshape South Indian history in many ways. And uh, you see uh, in this map, all the little dots, these were the uh, roughly in about the 12th century, uh, what are called the Brahmadeya settlements. So you see how uh, in the, the entire Chola Mandalam, uh, was inundated uh, with these Brahmadeyas, uh, creating a, 
uh, very strong uh, alignment between the royalty and caste hegemony through the Brahmin settlements. And one of the interesting feature for our discussion today, at least, is that uh, there is a, uh, as I said before, there is a process of mobilizing the Brahmin settlements for the purpose of augmenting revenue and to the larger purpose of building an empire and by collecting uh, uh, taxes. And therefore, the king and the Brahmin could share the uh, income from the land. And uh, one particular aspect of the Brahmadeya uh, is that, so in order, in the, in the process of reshaping the land, so the parallel irrigation canals, a new system of alignment with the land and canals is done. And uh, a particular school of political geographers have mapped how the alignment between land and caste uh, actually happens. So we will see in the next few slides as to how this particular alignment, which is physical re-engineering re of the earth happens and uh, how in this process, it was ensured that one single caste, you know, there is no discrimination within the caste in the horizontal thing. All of them are Brahmins, all of them are learned, all of them are Vedic Brahmins, and they can, there cannot be no discrimination. So how do you deal with the problem of ensuring equal distribution of land proportionately, ensuring fertility and access to water to all the Brahmins who are all equal? You cannot have discrimination in the quality of land while you are distributing to the same caste, isn't it? And therefore, this is handled by this pattern of uh, called the Kannar uh, and Saduram, uh, which is, you know, in many other uh, parts in the rest of the world as well, in Japan, in China, in most other cultures. We find, especially in deltaic areas, especially in deltaic areas, we find this uh, interesting pattern of what is called the checkerboard structure of uh, land, which is the square grid. As you can see in the cadastral map of the village called uh, uh, Devara in Pete, where we went and did uh, our work recently, followed by certain geographers who have already observed this pattern. So we see uh, that this elaborate checkerboard pattern of the land happens only in the Brahmin settlements, the Brahmadeyas, or what are also called the Chaturvedi Mangalams. So this, uh, so fertility and access to water is assured to each and every Brahmin who are brought in and settled, settled in this kind of villages. And slowly we find in the process, the Brahmins and temples are becoming the new rich landowners of the empire, speaking for the royalty, addressing the royalty, but also converting the previously existing free cultivators into tenants and to whom they will be collecting taxes from. So if we went through this elaborate process of physical reshaping and re-engineering of the earth through a geometric distribution of land, then, uh, you know, so you inscribe caste hegemony onto the earth. You know, it is has material, has how caste hegemony can get. And in this new arrangement, one thing which is completely noticeable is that the existing slave labor system remains intact. It is not disturbed at all. You know, the free cultivators becoming tenants, the tenants becoming you know, uh, subject to the new landowners who all belong to the same caste, who are the Brahmins, but then the slave labor continues to persist at the same time, without, uh, which is actually the source of labor that makes all the revenue calculations uh, possible. So in this square grid pattern, just to be able to understand, we have uh, uh, think so how, for instance, this axis, the x-axis is the Raja Raja Vaipal, which is particularly the, called the, the head canal. Uh, of the thing. So that runs uh, below. And then you have uh, the drainage canal, the vadi, which runs on the other side. And then you divide the land in terms of Karnara, which is the first one, the second, third, fourth, like that. And then each square within the Karnara then therefore gets access to water through field canals in between running crisscross right through the... Uh... So this geometric uh, arrangement then ensured a notional equality or a material equality, so to say and uh, ensuring irrigation infrastructure. And uh, we, we are not quite sure if it entirely, all of it happened from about the 10th century or what was the, if there was no square grid at all uh, previously, but there is enough conjecture to say that the presence of the Kannaru Sadaram, the presence of the square grid is in all Brahmadeya settlements, in these Brahmin settlements in the Agraharas. And then, uh, uh, 
and a particular process of revenue extraction happens around the uh, 11th century. So if you bring the reshaping of the earth and the reshaping of revenue administration together, then we have enough uh, evidence to uh, understand that, you know, uh, how the empire building exercise by establishing Brahmin hegemony actually perpetuated and reinforced uh, the extraction of labor through slavery uh, in, in about the 12th century. And how does, how does this extraction is ensured is where uh, the manipulation and the possibilities of computational practices comes into the picture. So once you have geometrically, materially inscribed hegemony onto the earth, then how do you then extract revenue out of the land? But to be able to make labor subject to this process of elaborate extraction is by, uh, by a particular process, which was computational, which was quite uh, universal in most of medieval, uh, the, in most of the medieval world, in most other civilizations and cultures as well, this process of quantification of quality. And what do we mean by that is that how do you then fold one measure into the other? It's literally folding two measures together to make one measure or an index of the measure. And uh, what is also can be understood as commensuration. So in the Chola times, we have uh, the quantification of quality by happening uh, through the system called the Madaki. Madaki in Tamil means folding, literally. And uh, we have uh, in the system of Madaki, uh, you know, for instance, uh, there are 14 grades of land uh, that we find from the inscriptions. And there are two possibilities of uh, organizing the Madaka system. So assuming, just to, I'm putting it very simply. So if there is like 100 acres of uh, land, then depending on the quality of the land, whether it's irrigated, depending on the type of the soil, how many crops can it be made out in a, in a particular season, depending on various variables, then you organize and grade the land into the thing and notionally then bend the land, expand it or shrink it in terms of its quality. So if it is 100 acres of wetland of very good soil, then it actually become 160 acres by the, by the time it enters the accountant register. Yeah, And if it is very poorly irrigated of a very dry soil, less cropping is possible, it probably becomes 60 or 40 or whatever. This folding, the shrinking and is called madaku and virivu in Tamil. So this system, which is completely notional, you know, abstracting the physical area of the land into an abstract notion of quality. Um, but then the revenue assigned and the taxation demanded out of, you know, each parcels of land will be based on the potential that the land has to yield uh, revenue, which is primarily in terms of grain. And there is also this elaborate system of labor as tax, which is corby labor or slave labor. And both grain and labor become interchangeable commodities. And while grain and labor become interchangeable commodities, which is central to the augmentation of revenue to establish caste hegemony and therefore building of the empire, we find the geometric redistribution of the land integrates itself with the notional computational apparatus, which is commensuration by folding one measure into the other, quality into quantity. And, uh, and then this arbitration, you know, but of course, there is a lot of conflict between geometry and the arithmetic manipulation comes through. And then in order to ensure that, you know, uh, that labor remains alienated, we find a lot of possibilities of manipulation that happens in the 12th century through the uh, measuring rod. And the measuring rod is often inscribed on the walls of temples like this that you see. Uh, you see the thin line uh, in the inscription. That's, so, so usually this, the standard measuring rod is inscribed onto the temple walls. You know? It's supposed to be transparent, open to public audit. And you say, you know, if, uh, if you all have disputes about your land, then go and you know, measure yourself against this uh, standard rod, which is the, uh, in the temple. And, uh, but then the problem with the measuring rod is that once we have the geometric redistribution enshrined onto the earth, and we have an elaborate computational apparatus through the empire's accountant by grading and folding and you know all the commensuration is happening at the end of the accountant. Then we have one physical device of measurement, which is a measuring rod, which is supposed to arbitrate disputes. But then the measuring rod itself was not very uniform. So there's always multiple standards of measuring rods. 
and you know sometimes there is also the local rod or called the you know the local measuring rod and then the royal rod which is usually about 24 feet as we have found in some other instances so we find the complex histories of standardization then becoming uh, you know becoming part and parcel of empire building contesting standardization and creating conflicts uh, between labor and uh, this thing. So we find uh, in the process, these are uh, typically how inscriptions are um, written on the walls. And we see uh, some about uh, uh, a corpus of inscription that we're still trying to study with most of us here, uh, should be Pearson and some of us in the room. Uh, we are trying to see uh, with the guidance of Professor Subrailu, who has taught us uh, how to put together and geographical you know uh, a geographical presence of a particular phenomena from about that spread over the entire cholamandalam that you see earlier on the map that there are two phases to the building up of a conscious building up of a uh, resistance and in the first phase which starts around uh, 1170 ad we find that people are uh, the landowners are trying to contest the state because along with the brahmins and the cultivators there are also state officials who are constantly trying to drain taxation from the uh, cultivators who represent the royal authority, which is always far away and distant. And when the royal authority is far away and distant, the possibility of manipulations at the local becomes enormous. And, and it is actually done through the uh, revenue accountant who was placed in the, uh, at the village level. And in this emerging contestation between uh, you know, the possibility of revenue extraction and the interchangeability of labor and grain as commodity, you know, as compulsory labor, as slave labor in the name of the king, <coughs> then the, the pressure because of reasons of military fiscal reasons or because of reasons of expansion around this time that the Chola Empire was undertaking. And there was a heavy tax extraction of tax around this time. And this is resisted over the about uh, 40, 50 years that we are trying to reconstruct now and hopefully write about it very soon is that uh, the, the first phase, the, the landowners are contesting the royal authority saying, you know, we are not being able to pay the tax fully. And then they have the specific complaint against the state officials who are the delegates of the royal authority in the locality. And they're saying this manipulation of the Madaka system, which is that they are deliberately doing the folding in terms of shrinking and expanding their real land and then arbitrarily fixing tax. Uh, so the notional computational apparatus renders itself to manipulation for reasons of extraction. And in the second phase, we find from about the turn of the 12th century, we find how uh, the, uh, the cultivators who are under the uh, Khani Alas and the, uh, under the Brahmin land laws are actually threatening the, the landowners that you know, they are not being able to subject themselves to this heavy process of extraction and they're often threatened to flee and they have actual instances of how the entire uh, cultivators have fled the land as a matter of protest and resistance and boycott and staying outside the village and then passing resolutions which does not include labor of course in the in that uh, resolution and we find the resolution like uh, in these temple walls where they say this the state officials in order to extract direct revenue what they are doing is actually manipulating the measuring rod and then increasing the total acreage of the land and demanding more tax instead of actually following the standard rod which is inscribed on the temple wall. So the possibility of manipulation then becomes real on both counts. Once you have ensured the geometric equality to establish the Brahmin hegemony, then the abstract computational apparatus takes over the process of extraction and renders itself possible to alienation of labor, which of course always remains invisible. Nobody talks about them. But the process of valuation begins at the notional creation of this computational apparatus through the commensuration process, which is folding one measure into the other. And also by, uh, despite the presence of a physical, you can't possibly bend the physical device of the measuring rod, right? But they can notionally expand it or shrink it and then alter it in order to suit uh, the purpose of extraction. And the third case uh, that we uh, talk about is uh, largely, uh, you know, the pearl state, the precious uh, stones. And the site of extraction is uh, the 16th century Gulf of Mana, 
you know, so these are migrating oysters in nature. The actual labor processes of diving and hunting, which is the primary source of value, to beat the pre-colonial times or after the colonial takeover. So we find the figure of the merchant trader reaping the uh, gains of this labor, which is completely erased from the process of valuation, which can be identified and studied through the uh, text uh, that we are trying with my colleague Prakash here. And he has done uh, this wonderful job of reconstructing the text so that you can see through the text that how uh, geometry and arithmetic comes together in the process of making value by erasing the labor process, which is in the actual process of time. So we find these are the little seas, which are called the pearl colanders, uh, which the pearl merchant then grates and sorts the uh, metal into the thing. And then the Muthukanaku, the text that we are uh, working on, actually provides a grammar to, uh, to how many holes, the size of the holes in each sieve. And the sieve is divided into particular angular segments. And then you know, there is an elaborate description of how the physical geometric device needs to be constructed. And once the physical geometric device grates and sorts the pearls, then the process of arithmetic takes over, which is the computation of value. And that arithmetic is done through the process of commensurating three different qualities by folding them into one, which is the Chebu. And we think it is an index. And the Chebu consists of the calculation of three different qualities, which are the size, the luster, and the weight. And the geometrical distribution in the then uh, physical device, which is the colander, the C, then makes possible the arith arithmetic tabulation of value. And we see yet again in history the process of in this case, through the practitioner of the merchant trader of pearls, we see the measurement of value begins after is uh, after labor. And finally, uh, I like to talk about uh, uh, one of the most important works. I mean, most of us are preoccupied with and therefore important, and also I think very important for all of us to wake up and listen to the uh, voices of the working women all over the country through the microfinance. Uh, industry and how it operates uh, through the establishment of a very intense process of extraction, which remains masked and disguised by a uh, by an algorithmic uh, industry uh, of an industrial scale, literally. And and the gap between uh, you know the wages of the working women and the creation of large capital for corporate today in neoliberal India guided by its right-wing administration, is that uh, how the household need for debt then becomes an actual demand for credit in the uh, financial market. And this has happened at a time when uh, public welfare schemes are uh, financialized and uh, increasing uncertainty uh, in terms of income and expenses has become reality. And uh, we are trying to study how interest rate modeling, scheduling, or optimized to maximize uh, repayment efficiency. And this creates a recursive loan, loan burden on the household. And Ganesh has put together this uh, diagram to show how uh, between uh, the household, you know, which is actually the source of labor and the site of social reproduction of labor, which is the working women's wages is not being able to address the needs of its own social reproduction at the household. And particularly because when health and education become the sources of rent to the state, which then uses the rent of the wage, rent, uh, wage as the rent in order to, through this elaborate infrastructure, by making it a source of demand for credit, and then hands it over to the complex other FinTech. FinTech is the pseudonym or, or an euphemism of, of you know, completely inundated with a host of microfinance companies, which is also called the non-banking finance sector, shamelessly, by the Reserve Bank of India. And then this fintech complex then makes, uh, through the legal instruments of the state, and then creates this two uh, thing, which is ranking and scoring of the credit worthiness on the one hand, through the creation of algorithmic instruments. And we see in the elaborate process, create a uh, credit and repayment schedule. So the scoring and ranking becomes quite central to the running of this uh, elaborate business of extraction of the working human's wage. And uh, there are quite a few models of uh, scoring and ranking. 
and each of them arbitrarily choose their own variable. You know, most of it is about you know the possibility of repayment, of course. But then they also follow and profile the household of each and every working woman through you know building variables on credit utilization, credit history, type of credit, you know balance, recent behavior, available credit. And we also find how increasingly working mathematicians, mathematics graduates, PhD scholars are being employed by the finance industry in order to be able to do active modeling, which is actually a cartographic enterprise, the mathematician doing the mapping of the working women's vulnerability and then make maps of seasonality and vulnerability together and then to see at what particular instance when the working woman is the most vulnerable that you can actually push more credit into the household you know and that's that's the job of the mathematician today in the finance industry at least and uh, you know so that is done by the so-called credit worthiness mapping and we have companies such as Highmark who actually proudly announce in their website that they have one of the most qualified and organized databases that profiles and addresses the each and every single working woman in the country. In fact, that is their ambitious goal in order to be able to profile the life of each and every single working woman in the country. And, uh, and you see that how you know the apparatus of compound interest then creates this credit and repayment schedule through the fintech algorithms. Uh, supported uh, by the mathematical models and creating a repayment schedule for the thing. And in this, both of them is done by this algorithmic instruments, uh, you know, which are actually uh, making ranking mechanisms and the resulting scores then will either force the women to take more credit or to be able to uh, extract more revenue out of the household and then never to be able to able for the working women to address the social reproduction concerns uh, of the household. And how this is done is through uh, creating a recursive uh, debt trap. And then you see, if I take loan from the first uh, microfinance institution, a company, then usually because welfare is financialized, because the state has withdrawn, because I'm supposed to buy the ability to work, the power of labor from the market, which actually, because of reasons of underemployment, unemployment, and the increasing uh, shortfall, the, the possibility to reproduce my own labor at the household, I am invariably not being able to pay the principal and the compound interest to the first creditor. And therefore, I go to the second one, which can usually be another MFI, or to the local loan shark, or to the so-called informal uh, credit market in the country, which controls about you know, 60 to 70 percent of uh, credit industry in the country even today, despite uh, the very recent data of the microfinance institution is to wean away, to take women out of the uh, circuit of indebtedness. But actually, we see how, you know, loan after loan then enters into the working women's household through this elaborate creation of the financial infrastructure, which is computational by subjecting women to a complete cycle of uh, indebtedness. So this is uh, one of the most uh, consequences, important consequences to us is that it polarizes the women into good debtors and bad debtors. You know, so if the repayment schedule is done properly, then women became you know the well-behaved women. Then you know, then uh, especially during the COVID pandemic that we've seen, you know, they are being able to fragment the local social fabric, the possibility of solidarity and the possibility of coming to the possibility of mutual aid, which was integral to the social fabric of the working women through this financialization algorithm is actually became fragmented. And this infrastructure therefore becomes integral to the alienation of uh, uh, labor. <clears throat> so we see in all these uh, instances, how uh, you know, if, if we uh, reframe and ground mathematics as work, like in the case of the church official, Copenhagen, the state astronomer, and the revenue official of the Cholas, or the mercantile uh, trader in the 16th century. And uh, finally, also in the case of uh, the contemporary working mathematician who is working for the finance industry today, we see the possibilities of alienation is orchestrated and built. And alienability is built into mathematics by making erasing labor in the first instance, always after the instance of measurement and creating a value creating apparatus of the labor. 
and then but on the at the same time we have the promise of universality we have the promise of professional virtuosity we find you know we have the promise of transparency and fairness but all the time evading the practice of uh, mathematics in particularly when grounded in occupations and work and this process of alienation then you know you can call it you know it's uh, you know there are abstraction is double edged you know it cuts both ways you know if its abstraction is liberating abstraction is also oppressive but then we need to choose you know which abstraction is better for us all right but then one of the objectives that we constantly keep searching for is that is there a non alienating mathematical practices that can actually make political partisanship possible that makes us stand in solidarity with the working people and then to subvert and then to question the process of alienation that some of these working practices and knowledge practices when they come together and that's one of the abiding purpose of the politically mathematics collective and we hope uh, it's an open invitation to all of you to come and join us and contribute to your uh, continuing work thank you thank you so much babu what a powerful talk thank you so much yeah uh, i am sure everyone here is feeling the same the way i am feeling it's, it was really a great talk and lot of questions and discussion uh, points that uh, takes us from here uh, what we'll do uh, given that there is less time we'll take three questions maybe uh, and then we'll request organizers <laughs> to do something more around these lines uh, so for the so babu i'll read the questions from the chat one by one and then you and your colleagues can respond to that is that okay yeah sure yeah yeah sorry so i didn't it, uh, i didn't realize i was no no time. anxious yeah Uh, so there is a question from uh, Ravi Subramaniam. Uh, how do the claims and contestations by merchant uh, guilds of medieval South India figure into this narrative? How did they mediate surplus extraction and harnessing of computation for this? About merchants. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, merchant uh, yeah, guilds right. like the five hundred and so on. So. Sorry, Ravi, you were talking about uh, mental, merchant guilds. Uh, merchant guilds, uh, who also ah, uh, merchant guilds. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we know uh, at least from the inscription, we know very less about. Uh, uh, and then there is a debate among historians as to can we actually look for the presence of a guild, like in the European case here. But then we do find uh, from about the middle of the twelfth century a process of monetization. where trade particularly uh, artisanal uh, uh, produce uh, in clothes and uh, edible products such as oil then seem to organize themselves in, into this uh, guilds but uh, very few uh, records of practices of these uh, working people are available but uh, learning from what professor subrailu has uh, spoken to us about the presence of this merchant guilds there is this uh, Uh, intimate connection between uh, between the royalty and especially we see in about from about the 14th century there is a conscious effort to settle this uh, merchants into areas where there is uh, less possibility of production and then they could create more uh, enterprise only uh, uh, to such an extent that we actually know the presence of this merchant guilds but not enough uh, things so but there are some works especially done about medieval weaving by vijay ram swami and others which kind of throws open to the window uh, of the presence of this merchant but their computational practices in medieval india is not available to us unfortunately because what are available are highly fragmented pieces of information in the inscriptions on temple walls so do you have any follow up question uh, subramanian Uh, no thanks okay yeah so there is another question from karen hedo uh, you mentioned several forms of alienation occurring during the period of south indian history uh, you are studying can you generalize as to whether alienation was increasing over this period also i am interested in hearing your ideas on the relations between alienation and the development of mathematics ha ah, thanks karen it's uh, definitely yes uh, surplus extraction was uh, reaching phenomenal proportions 
uh, in large empires, like this Polish uh, historian Witold Kula says, uh, the larger the uh, the possibility of extraction, the finer the measurement gets, right? And therefore, when the finer the measurement gets, then you delegate more responsibility to the bureaucracy, and therefore the mediation of extraction then is increasingly, you know, removed from the directly coercive authority of the state, and then elaborating bureaucratic structure. Uh, and then, since historians like some of us, we actually study the left, uh, the leftovers of the bureaucratic practices. We, it, you know, takes a lot more effort to see how uh, surplus extraction then drives most of this centralizing state apparatus and increases the coercive authority of the state on the one hand, and therefore direct expropriation of uh, labor in most cases. Especially in the Chola uh, thing, for instance, we have we do have a political fragmentation of the empire itself starting from about the 13th century onwards, but then it does not mean that you know it eliminated slavery or this thing. So slavery persisted right through the 14th and 15th century, even through the formation of the Vijayanagara period in South India, where new avenues of extraction were continuously created, but not stopped. And this thing, of course, if you read the inscriptions or the records of this thing, we'll all find exchange in slavery or exchange of slave labor, for instance, exposed in very nice little terms and so on. But in actually read behind the lines, it is a lot more extraction uh, happening. And uh, this thing about alienation and development mathematics, I wish some of us more actively talk about it. And, uh, and, and it's not uh, something that we should be uh, afraid of talking, you know. So what, uh, and, the, and the quest for uh, uh, the search of a mathematical practice, which will make, uh, you know, labor non-alienable is actually the commonly shared quest. And then in history, if we uh, move away from the hegemony of the mind and bring the hand and the mind together, and then study real practices, I think there is a possibility to have much more uh, understanding about the, uh, the dialectics of uh, uh, alienation and the development of mathematics, not the hey, historical uh, formal proof generated definition of mathematics that we all actually know about, but then the real practitioner's mathematics, which is uh, part of the everyday. Yeah. Karen, do you have any follow-up question on that? Uh, no, that's fine. I'm I'm really looking forward to to reading your published references. I hope you you let everyone know. Yeah. So there yeah, are sure. several requests like that, Babu, in the chat box. Hope you get time to read those. Uh, others have also yeah. wished to read your publication. There is a comment from uh, Lodaya. Hey, Lodaya. Uh, so I'll just read it. Uh, it's not a question for traders. It was very important for both boy and girl children to know writing and arithmetic. So can think of education as a distinguishing advice and measurement standards with templates rules as regulating device. Uh, if you want to comment anything on this, Babu, otherwise there are some more questions. I think. Yes, Kamal, that's interesting uh, that you say that. But uh, uh, we have uh, we have very little understanding of uh, the nature of uh, the pedagogic uh, apparatus. Uh, uh, you know, we have. Uh, you know, because we only have few very, very fragmented evidence of what could have been the nature of curriculum and the pedagogic transactions in the schools. And uh, if one had to reconstruct the actual, uh, you know, questions of access, the, the orientation of the curriculum, you know, if we want to, if you want to ascribe functionality and then align it with, with the social enterprises and the goals of various professions around that time, it's quite easy to do. But then, you know, uh, we have to be also careful to see how professional virtuosity cannot be, you know, uh, transposed on to the uh, orientation of the curriculum itself. But then I see uh, that, you know, uh, the education actually in terms of access did uh, become a device of distinction. And uh, the possibility of regulation, therefore, as I was trying to say, is that the idea of regulation then only to a point, after that it actually becomes a device to perpetuate uh, exploitative structures, isn't it? And therefore, uh, the regulatory authorities, uh, you know, always promise, and in the process of promise, actually uh, remain evasive uh, in the actual uh, activity. And uh, that's what I was trying to say. Hope uh, that came across. Thank you, Babu. 
Uh, there is uh, there are a lot more questions, uh, but I'll take few more. Uh, Supermanam, your question, I'll come back again. I'll give some chance to some uh, new uh, participants, and then I'll come back if there is time. Uh, there is a question from uh, Ayush uh, that I'm curious if you see the uh, financial technologies. I think that is what it means, and land measurement complex system as parallel to the apparatus of measurement in education, uh, with its structure of merit, status, and elimination of labor. With folks like me, uh, elite and uh, institutions, as sort of the mediators of the state, like the land measurement officials. Yes, sir. Yes. I think uh, I think uh, you see it very clearly. Therefore, all of us do see it, and uh, you know, and and in the times of uh, increasing techno managerial uh, apparatus that is. Uh, you know, not just really, most of educational institutions are becoming, you know, uh, we have seen very recently how cases of, uh, uh, you know, victimization have become the routine order in these kind of institutions in the, in the questions of, you know, productivity. So this increased sense of managerial uh, and uh, production-centered thing and project-based funding uh, is pushing uh, the, the limits of, uh, you know, this alignment between knowledge and uh, and solidarity a bit more difficult, I think, as we all uh, are directly confronting it most of the time. But uh, yeah, this uh, this this official term, uh, the bureaucratic authority. You know, the interesting thing about it is that you know they often do not realize that rule making as an epistemic activity actually you know continues into. Uh, the anticipation of the possibility of its own denial. And therefore, when they anticipate the possibility of the denial of your own rules from being followed, then actually you become very quiescent in the process, right? So then uh, it's like, you know, you, you all the time keep enacting laws in anticipation of its own violation and in the process creating an elaborated coercive apparatus, right? And that's what happens when bureaucratic managers take over education institutions, right? And therefore, uh, and that is the caution that we do have to keep in mind. And therefore, instead, therefore, our appeal, I mean, the appeal of uh, the political mathematics collective, especially is to you know, cultivate and nurture a sense of partisanship and to be able to abide by the concerns of the working people yeah, as our everyday practice. In order, then hopefully it will subject the creeping in of the techno managerial thing into the curricular process itself. Uh, Ayush, do you have any follow-up question, comment on this? No, that was really helpful and brought brought clarity. Thank you, Babu. I agree with somebody who's saying you know you should have given four talks. It was it was really great to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I am uh, Babu. I hope you are not very tired. I'm going to take liberty, like Deepa said. No, 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 no. Sure, sure, sure. So I'll ask you more questions that are here. Uh, there is a question from Ishan Santra. Uh, uh, in the context of the conclusion diagram on the common patterns. Where do we, mathematicians and math educational researchers, figure? What is type of uh, our labor? What does it contribute to? Uh, to the already existing elimination by increasing the radius of mathematical realm. If I do not want to contribute to that as a math ed researcher, uh, what should I do? What are the immediate actionable points as math education for math education researchers? Thanks, Ishan. Uh, you probably know better. You are a practitioner yourself. So, but then if you want to take this as an opportunity to talk about the possibilities, then uh, as I just said, it's uh, to us one of the things that has become central is to uh, go beyond conventional uh, institutional spaces, uh, you know, not just confine ourselves to the uh, formal classroom, but to be able to, uh, you know, identify concerns of the working people as central concerns of our own work, and then uh, imagine mathematics education in the real spaces of uh, the neighborhood, you know, the, the household, the trade union spaces, and so on. So, if so, what happens if we actually uh, move away and then you know talk about organized exchange of knowledge? Not because it is you know the so-called uh, idiom of you know being science for the people, you know, carrying science, you know, carry science to the people. Not in that manner. Uh, but the, the challenge of democratization of knowledge today at the contours of it is very different, as we know. And uh, when contractual science 
the doing of science has become increasingly contractualized. You know, the objectives and orientation of the practice of science itself is, you know, given over uh, to the corporate. Then uh, I think it's all the more important for us to uh, firmly stand by the working people, uh, not not just a notional, tokenish, rhetorical idea of solidarity, but in reality actually stand by and then you know align our interests with that. And then and then I think uh, we have a lot more to do in terms of what would that pedagogic space look like, you know, as a mathematics education researcher or a science education researcher. Thank you, Babu. Uh, Ishan, do you have any uh, comment or further question in this regard? Okay. Mm -hmm. He's not on speaker. Uh, so there is there are two more questions, Babu. So this is from yeah. Shreya. Uh, she says, "Thank you so much, Babu." Uh, and given uh, notional computations you talked of in establishing Brahman hegemony over land revenue. And then what you said of how more the extraction increased the finer measurement and more elaborate it got. In terms of political demands of working women, can one go beyond depth translation to, uh, in fact, create elaborate computations of the historical depth, their own computations of justice, so to speak? Do working mathematicians incline towards social justice concerns? And yes, she asked, yeah. have ideas on what such computations and measures could entail? That's what we are supposed to work together on, Shia. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so I think um, it's one of the things, uh, especially uh, uh, Tata, Tata Gat, yeah, is, uh, I mean, exactly, he's what uh, is more uh, primary concern is to look at uh, this issue. So, if we have to account for, in fact, when we're going and studying inscriptions, you know, it's uh, this complete stark absence of, uh, there is a large presence of credit. The complete absence of women on the one hand. You know? So this idea of uh, what could have been the sources of social reproduction of all that corby labor, all that compulsory labor was very stark. And then, uh, so Tata was in fact saying, if one were to compute, you know, all the time and leisure that, you know, that this computational apparatus and the building of it has actually uh, uh, took place, then would it be able to, would we, would we be able to reverse that computation in favor of finding the possibilities of justice. So that's that's something that I think uh, it's a very central task that is in front of us. And uh, all the historical debt, you know, uh, so that it does not become yet another, you know, uh, matrix uh, calculations and uh, so on, which usually assumes the tone of technocracy uh, that you know, or probably more than me. And, uh, you know, so to work out what would be the uh, computations and measures uh, you know, to make uh, justice much more proximate than what it seems right now, I think uh, is something uh, that I, you know, that we all have to learn from. Uh, I think, uh, especially some of the things that we are trying to attempt now, which is to, uh, if one were to elaborate on uh, the flow of wealth out of the working women's wages and how it becomes rent in the absence of public education and public health. And then how the market uses the rent through the formal banking system and then delivers it as a source of capital to corporate uh, this thing. The flow of wealth is mapped. And, uh, you know, then probably there the possibility of, uh, you know, how, how the reversal, how the computations of justice can be worked out. That's one possibility uh, that we are considering. And then uh, most of the working women are also quite... Uh, telling and they are saying look uh, the more you come and speak to us as if you no know, we don't know how we are being oppressed or how we are being exploited to the microfinance industry but they are asking us to consciously go and speak to the industry itself and say if you are university trained then you understand their language and then you go spend more time with them instead of coming to us and then tell us about how they think and the thought process in which they work and you come back and tell us as to how they, how that, that process actually ends up being exploited, right? So if you have to bring these two tasks together, then I think the possibility of a non-alienating computational practice, which is which brings us much more closer to the uh, to justice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kam. Shreya, do you have any uh, returning comment, feedback, question? 
no thank you very much babu just one thing that of course i assume that will be of concern for everyone that that would then have implications i assume for mathematics education programs in the sense of what education in like what kind of math ed programs will be needed to have math graduates get out and do this kind of computational work rather than get into fintech companies working out like the vulnerability of working within i suppose so how to move in that direction But thank you very very much for this and really big salam to lovely work that you all are doing thank you shreya uh, babu there is a similar question on this line uh, from ravi subramanian but in a more general sense and also i think about creation of mathematics is uh, what reflections you have on what uh, what could be the kind of mathematics that can be supportive of liberation yeah one is uh, to uh, to consciously uh, win away from uh, contractual uh, neoliberal practice of science that i think uh, and then to subject ourselves to scrutiny our own practice as to what do we do with our own students what do we do with our own uh, ways of thinking and when do we say that we align with power when is it that we Uh, we might be able to refuse to align with power, you know, with a particular thought. But not just in terms of professional work, where you know where I go meet working women, write a paper about it, but not that. But then to be able to alter and change the, our own process of work and cultivate this strong sense of partisanship, I think. And and I think this political partisanship has become very central because if it becomes, uh, you know, my it's my nine to five job, but after five I am uh, doing something else. Now I don't think. uh you know that often creates a predicament for us and all of us are constantly facing it in our everyday work and you know that really more than me and therefore it's uh, uh the search for a non alienating uh mathematical practice about the possibilities of liberation uh we'll have to see but i think to begin with you know the search for this non alienating non alienating practice of mathematics i think is Uh, like the working women demand from us you know you go speak and understand their thought process and how do they end up becoming so so exploitative is something that you know uh, you come back and translate uh, that thought process to us i think the the working the intricacies and the inner world of uh, the techno managerial the contractual the new liberal uh, the practitioners of science and mathematics i think uh, and also you know, we all know that uh, you know uh, this elaborate uh, certification industry that uh, higher education has become and you know so if if you want if you want to continue to remain part of that industry then how do we redefine our own relationship not just professionally but also politically to that industry i think are two beginning points that we constantly do talk about and think about but uh, uh, mathematics for liberation uh, yes of course you know definitely we have to uh look and organize this spaces of knowledge exchange outside formal institutions and then bring those concerns back into the institutions and create this heavy traffic and very active basis between the two spaces i think uh could be a beginning yeah so our time time is up uh, thank you so much babu there is one more question from subramanam about uh, article by sarma but you can read it and maybe respond later or chat later we have to close yeah. the session uh, the poster session is at 11 was supposed to be at 11:20 it will happen at 11:25 now with 5 minutes break but i want to say uh, thank you so much uh, and i share with everyone here when i say that we need some follow up uh, task discussion workshop after this and it's a request to organizers uh, to do something on this line i i'm sure i share everyone's feelings here so let's give a big round of uh, hand for babu and his team so thank you so much Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. I hope uh, all of us will consider working with us, the politically mathematics collective, and hopefully we'll be able to do some work together. Thank you.